Amen. Good morning. January 1985, the mountain next to the city of Armero in Tulima, Colombia began to smoke. Snow on top of the mountain began to melt and the rivers began to rise. No one was afraid because they thought that any lava or mud would be channeled into the nearby river in the event that such an unlikely occurrence would take place. On September 11th of 1985, nine months later, the earth began to shake and an audible rumble could be heard coming from the mountain. The roads to the mountain were closed due to constant mudslides. It became impossible to keep their houses clean due to the ash in the air. They could smell sulfur in the air. On November 13th, the mountain dr dramatically increased the smoke and ash that it was spewing. That evening at 7 p.m., the town priest came on the radio and told the people there was no reason to panic and to please stay calm. The Department of Civil Defense said there was no reason to be concerned. The town bishop came out and warned against fanatics who made it sound as if a major disaster was about to take place. The mayor stated publicly that there, were no, that there was no need to worry, and then the mayor rapidly skipped town. One of Columbia's top scientists said this volcano is not going to erupt, nothing is going to happen, and beware of speculations and exaggerations that say that it will. The Secretary of Mines said that nothing would happen, and even the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, said that it is very unlikely that the city could be buried by rocks, lava, or mud. The Regional Emergency Committee that very evening said, do not expect any dangers. In fact, go out and enjoy this spectacular uh, event in nature. A torrential rain began to fall, and what many described as an almost supernatural darkness came over the mountain in the city of Armero. That very night, the night of November 13th, 1985, the mountain erupted. A large boulder blocked the river that they relied on for protection from an eruption and actually routed the flow of lava right towards the city. The whole city of Armero, Colombia was buried under tons of mud, rocks, and debris. 22,000 people died that night. What did the evidence say was going to happen? that it was going to erupt. They had 11 months. They had 11 months in which to act accordingly. But the experts, people came out and told them to ignore the evidence. And 22,000 people lost their lives. As Christians, what is our source of evidence? Would it be the Bible? Today an interesting thing happens because as Christians, our source of evidence should come from the Bible. But there are many people, many experts out there telling us to ignore that evidence. As Seventh-day Adventists, I believe we have a very special understanding of scripture because we as a people believe what the Bible actually says. That very special understanding is reflected in our own 28 fundamental beliefs. Those beliefs are very special. They have several thing in, things in common. There is one common denominator with the 28 fundamental beliefs that I want to focus on. But I want you to understand them for yourselves 
So we're going to do a brief review of the 28 fundamental beliefs. Printed out directly from the Seventh-day Adventist website I have in front of me are 28 fundamental beliefs, the summary of them. And there's a little introduction here which I would like to read and see if you see a theme in this introduction. Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and hold certain fundamental beliefs to be the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs, as set forth here, constitute the Church's understanding and expression of the teaching of Scripture. Revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the Church is led by the Holy Spirit to a further understanding of Bible truth or finds better language in which to express the teachings of God's Holy Word. Within that introduction, the Bible or Scripture is mentioned five times. Do you see a theme right there in that introduction? The theme is the Bible. That is our source. That is our source of information that leads to salvation. The very first of the fundamental beliefs, in fact, states this. The Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God given by divine inspiration. The inspired authors spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in this word. God has committed to humanity the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and the infallible revelation of God's will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the definitive revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. The Bible is our source. Now the second the third, the fourth, and the fifth of our fundamental beliefs involve the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For those beliefs, if we want to know more about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, about the Godhead, where do we begin? The Bible, but where in the Bible? Open your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 1. To show you something here. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Already in the first two verses, you see a plurality. You see God, and you see the Spirit of God. And then, by the time you get to verse 26 of chapter 1, it says this, Then God said, God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over all creeping things on the earth. You see the plurality of God right there at the very beginning. And as you move throughout the Bible, you start getting more bits and pieces as the Bible reveals the picture of the Godhead. Until by the time you reach Revelation you see a full picture of the Godhead. In other words, you start at the beginning, you go through to the end, and only by the time you've gone through the entire Bible do you have a complete picture of the Godhead. That's how our faith works. That's the method by which our forefathers, the founders of this church, studied. They went throughout the entire Bible and they got a complete picture. And only then did they realize, now we have a complete picture of what it is that we're studying. And that encompasses 
now through belief number five. Now, belief number uh, six, belief number six, creation. Now, where do we start in the Bible if we want to know about creation? Genesis. Imagine that. And we see the creation, but then we also see the fall. And the whole rest of the Bible, as we study it out, is God leading us to restoration. By the time we reach the last three chapters of Revelation, what do we see in the last three chapters of Revelation? The recreation. The restoration of the original creation, only better. In order to find out about creation, we start at the beginning and we go all the way through and only then do we have a complete picture. Belief number seven, the nature of humanity. If we want to look in the Bible at the nature of humanity and where the nature of humanity started, where do we begin? Genesis, Genesis with the first people, with the first humans. And we walk through clear to the end and only then do we have a complete picture. Belief number eight. And I'm doing, I'm doing this one by one for a reason. Because I want you to wrap your mind around each one of our beliefs here. Belief number eight, the great controversy. Where did the controversy begin in which Satan wanted control of Adam and Eve? In the Garden of Eden. That's where we see the beginning of the controversy. And only do we get a complete picture of the controversy when we go all the way through we see the entire story and we see how the controversy ends in Revelation belief number nine the life the death and the resurrection of Christ turn with me if you will to John chapter one John chapter one and verse one John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. First of all, where does it send us? Where does the very first words of John chapter 1 send us? In the beginning was the Word. It sends us back to the beginning, doesn't it? it? Sends us back to Genesis. Now also in this, you see the plurality. You see the pluralness of God. You begin to see a picture of the Godhead. With this, hopefully you're beginning to see not only how each time we go back to the beginning... But also, each one of these things are interrelated to one another. As we go through, each and every one of these beliefs interact with one another. It sends us to the beginning. Not only do we have the life of Christ, we, we begin to see that as his creator, but throughout the Old Testament, we have little stories, little accounts in history that give us miniature pictures of Christ. Uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac, or attempting to sacrifice Isaac on, the, on Mount Moriah, is a perfect miniature picture of Christ giving up his life on our behalf. And all throughout the Old Testament, we have these miniature pictures of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And then we reach the New Testament, and we see the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And by the time we get to Revelation, we see the results of this. The, the, the purpose behind his life, death, and resurrection is to bring us back, to restore us to as we were in the beginning. Belief number 10, the experience of salvation, and belief number 11, growing in Christ. I'm going to combine those two. 
Where does salvation begin? Where do we find the need for salvation? Back in the Scriptures, but back in Genesis. We see the reason for our need for salvation at the fall. And we go all the way through. We see the results at the end. We have a complete picture throughout the Word of God. Belief number 12, the church. Who or what is the church? Is it this building? No. Each and every one of us as followers of God, the people, we are the church. So where do we see the first followers of God? Where do we see in the Bible the very first people that followed God? We're back to the beginning again. And to see that complete picture, we've got to go all the way through. Belief number 13, the remnant and its mission. What is a remnant? It's what's left from what began, from the original. Right there, by there being a remnant, there has to be an original. In order to see the original, we have to go back to the beginning. And once again, just like within the life of Christ, you have miniature pictures all throughout the Old Testament that give us an idea of the remnant. Noah is a beautiful example of the remnant of what's left of God's people. And that's just one example. But we start at the beginning and we go through until what do we see in Revelation? Do, is there a remnant in Revelation? Yes, there is. The remnant that keeps the commandments of God is persecuted and they have the faith in Jesus. We see this in Revelation and the entire picture is in between. Belief number 14, unity in the body of Christ. Unity of who? Of what? Of his people, of us. We kind of just went through that. We are the church. To see that unity... We have to look at the whole picture. Now number 15 is interesting. Baptism. Baptism. Can we go back to Genesis with baptism? I like watching you think. What does baptism stand for? What does it mean? I'm hearing lots of answers here. Baptism... Represent, well, let me read it. By baptism we confess our faith in the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and testify of our death to sin for our, and of our purpose to walk in newness of life. Thus we acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior, become his people, and are received as members by his church. If we want to know what baptism truly is, we have to look at the meaning which ultimately takes us back through multiple channels back to the beginning. We have to understand the life of Christ. That begins back at the beginning. We have to understand his people. That goes back to the beginning. Ultimately, to understand baptism and what it means, we've got to go back to the beginning and go all the way through to the end and see the results of what happens to those that are baptized, of those that accept Christ. We're restored. Restoration at the end. Now how about the Lord's Supper? Can we go back to Genesis with the Lord's Supper? Just ask yourself, what does the Lord's Supper mean? What does it represent? Christ. His last meal. What do the bread and the wine represent? The body and his blood. His death on the cross. To understand his death and what it meant, we have to understand his life, which we've already covered, it takes us back to the beginning. We have miniature pictures of his death all throughout the Old Testament of his life, his death, and his resurrection. To really understand the Lord's Supper and what it means, it is a complete Bible study from beginning to end.
Beliefs number 17 and 18. Spiritual gifts and its ministries and the gift of prophecy is one of those gifts. That's 17 and 18. Gift of prophecy. When we go back to Genesis, do we see prophets in Genesis? Who was the first man that was taken to heaven? Enoch. You know the book of Jude calls Enoch a prophet? Do you realize Noah was a prophet? There were prophecies involved with each of these men. The spiritual gifts can be found all throughout the lives of of the very first people, starting in Genesis, going all the way through. If you want a complete picture of the spiritual gifts, you've got to start at the beginning and go all the way through. And what is one of the gifts listed in Revelation, one of the identifying characteristics of God's remnant or end time church? Spirit of prophecy. Do you see where I'm going with this? Belief number 19, the law of God. Belief number 20, the Sabbath. Can we see every single one of the Ten Commandments reflected in Genesis before they're even given in Exodus? Was it still a sin to murder? Was it still a sin to... We could go through each one. That's right. Each and every one of them are there. In fact, did Adam and Eve keep the Sabbath? Yes, they did. Does the Bible say that they did? Christ himself actually said they did. Did you realize that? Christ himself says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Christ himself says the Sabbath was made sending us back to creation for man. Whether it's man or mankind, whichever way you do it, who was the only man or mankind there when the Sabbath was made? Adam and Eve. The Sabbath was made for man. At its creation, it was made for Adam and Eve. They kept the Sabbath. Christ himself says so. And by the time we reach Revelation, do a search sometime and see how many times keep the commandments are mentioned, do the commandments are mentioned in just the book of Revelation. It's eye-opening. Stewardship, belief number 21. You know, in each of these beliefs, it gives a little list, a very short list list for a very brief study involving uh, uh, just so you can get an idea of what each of these beliefs are based off of. And right here in stewardship, it sends us back to 1, Genesis 1, verse 26. We already read that earlier. 126 is where God made man in his image and then gave man dominion over the earth. Right there, God said... Here's the earth, I'm creating it, and I'm putting you in charge of it. Right there we see the beginnings of stewardship. God puts man in charge of his stuff. And we are to be responsible and to care for it. And if you want to get more specific with tithe, Melchizedek is right there in Genesis, in which Abraham gave him 10%. And the stewardship is to be carried through throughout the Bible. And even in the end, we see the dominion being given back. We see the earth being given back to God's people. Belief number 22, Christian behavior. Do I even need to go over that one? How the followers of Christ should behave Was it bad when Cain killed Abel? Yes. Marriage in the family, belief number 23. 
Where was the first marriage? And by the time we reach Revelation, we see Christ marrying the church, His people. We see the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see the final fulfillment of what marriage here on earth is supposed to teach us. We get the complete picture when we go from Genesis to Revelation. Putting up with each other, no matter how hard it seems sometimes, is one of the things that God tries to teach us because He puts up with us. Belief number 24. We're almost there. Belief number 24. Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, including the investigative judgment. Well, first of all, Christ, uh, the heavenly sanctuary, hopefully you're, you're, you're all aware, the heavenly sanctuary lays out in detail the plan of salvation. How each one of us are saved. And that plan of salvation is reflected from Genesis to Revelation. That's what the heavenly sanctuary lays out. To learn about the heavenly sanctuary, the plan of salvation, you have to go from beginning to end. Now the investigative judgment, this one is particularly uh, close to me. And I don't remember if in, in one of my past sermons I've talked about this gentleman, but I got to know a man that was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, educated in Seventh-day Adventist schools, went on to become a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And when he was questioned one day on the investigative judgment, in his mind he didn't understand the things that we have been talking about today, on how each one of these beliefs is laid out to get the entire picture. You have to go throughout the entire Bible. He did not understand this. So in his mind, he went to the book of Hebrews because that's where he thought the investigative judgment was. And there's definitely a pieces of it there. But when he couldn't find the whole investigative judgment in the book of Hebrews, he had a crisis of faith. And that crisis led from one belief to the next. And because he didn't know how our beliefs are laid out throughout the entire Bible, ultimately, he left the church. Ultimately, he left Christianity. An Adventist pastor, because he didn't understand the very thing that we're discussing today. Can you find the investigative judgment in the book of Genesis? Many, many places. When Adam and Eve fell, God went walking in the garden and he asked a very interesting question for a God to ask. He said, where are you? And then he asked Adam and Eve, what have you done? Did he not know the answer? Of course he knew. He was God. So for what purpose or for whose benefit did he ask that question? Did he do that little bit of investigation? He did it for Adam and Eve's benefit. He did it for the benefit of the watching angels. He did it for our benefit looking back on this event. God wants to remove all doubts in our minds, in the minds of the watching universe. This goes back to the great controversy. Once again, all these things fit together on how the universe is watching this world. We are a theater for the world. The Bible lays that out. God asked these questions to which he already knew the answer, not for his benefit, but for ours, for theirs. And as you go through various events in Genesis, just Genesis alone, the flood, the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, each one of these things, you find God either coming down to earth to examine what is going on, or you have God asking questions to which he already knows the answers to. The way God works before any major thing like this happens, he does an investigation for the benefit of the onlookers. He already knows the answer, but he does it to answer our questions 
and the questions of the watching angels and the rest of the universe. He does an investigation. And as we go throughout the Bible, we can see this miniature picture time and time again played out. God says in Revelation, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to each man according to his work. When God comes back at his second advent, he has his reward with him, meaning that the judgment was done pre-advent. You have right there in that one statement, the pre-advent judgment in the book of Revelation. If you want a complete picture of the investigative judgment, you don't just look in Hebrews. There's some very important stuff in Hebrews about it. But you look throughout the entire Bible. Belief number 25, the second coming of Christ. The return of Christ. Do we find information regarding the return of Christ in Genesis. Well, first of all, it's the second coming. It means that there was a first time God was here. To understand the second, we need to understand the first. And to understand the first, we need to understand who it is that is coming brings us back to understanding Christ, our Creator, which sends us back to the beginning not to mention little pictures as well throughout the Old Testament that give us an idea of what the return of Christ is going to be like. In fact, the Jews focused on those second pictures, not having a correct concept of God. They focused on the pictures of his second coming, and that's what they were expecting the first time he came. The second coming of Christ begins there. And we see the actual return of Christ, not only miniature pictures throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, we get little pictures here and there, little pieces, but we see the actual return in Revelation and what it means for us. Belief number 26, the death and resurrection, or death and resurrection in general, did not... Satan, tell Eve, you will not surely die. That was the first lie. And yet the majority of the Christian world believes it. If the majority of the Christian world would understand that all we have to do is start at the beginning and look at what the Bible has to say about death and resurrection and life, all we have to do is start at the beginning and go all the way through, and by the end we'll have a complete picture. If the majority of the Christian world understood that, we wouldn't be in the position we are today. But yet we have the majority of the Christian world throwing out the Old Testament, which includes the first lie, you will not surely die. I could really go into depth in that one. but <sighs> Belief number 27. The millennium and the end of sin. Well, to understand the end, we have to understand the beginning. But specifically, the millennium, the thousand years. If we're going to understand what that is like, turn with me to Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I want you to see this for yourself. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah here is given a picture of the millennium. And notice what he says. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens they had no light. Now before I read any further, do you recall a place where we find something without form and void? I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. And, and I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. And beheld... The, I, 
I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Jeremiah himself, when referring to the state of the world, sends us back to Genesis. And there's a very important reason for that. And this is a whole study in and of itself. But if you look at the seven last plagues, I'll just give you the brief summary. The seven last plagues reverse the order of creation. One by one, the seven last plagues knock this earth back to the state that it was in in the beginning until finally it was without form and void and there was no life left on it. So to truly understand the millennium and the end of sin, we've got to go back to the beginning. And then go all the way through. And only then, by the time we reach the end, do we understand the end. And finally, belief number 28. The last of the 28 fundamental beliefs, for now anyway. See, back in my day, there were 27 of them. But <laughs> now there are 28. The new earth. Well, if there's a new earth, there was an old earth. Creation, restoration. See how all these things tie together. We see the picture like it was in the beginning, and at the end we see what, it was gonna be, what it's going to be like again. Have I made my point? Do you see what all 28 of these beliefs have in common? Each and every one of them is a complete Bible study that takes us from the beginning of Scripture to the end. And there are many reasons why we need to focus on this. And there's other things they have in common. They all interconnect. And they all focus on God or Christ. They are all... Christ-centered. As you go through each one, I, in the limited time we have, I probably didn't do a real good job of presenting that, but I'm focusing on the fact that each and every one of them are a complete Bible study from beginning of Scripture to end. And the, there's a reason I'm doing this. First, let me say this. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Back in my day, there were 27 fundamentals. There are 28 now. As we get closer to the end, the Holy Spirit is going to show His church new light, new revelations. We are going to understand the Bible better. And perhaps these 28 fundamental beliefs that we have now will change, perhaps not. But either way, I believe there is still new light yet to be had. But I will tell you this. Any new light that comes up better match with this. If someone comes to you and says, I have a new idea, and it involves something spiritual, but they don't have a Bible study to go along with it. Now, I'm not talking one or two texts taken out of context. That's not a Bible study. These are Bible studies. If someone comes to you and they have a new idea that involves spirituality in the church and they don't have a Bible study to go along with it, that's a red flag. We are to test these new ideas, these new things that come along, because there will be new light. But we need to be very careful and we need to test them and make sure that they match. That they go along with Scripture from beginning to end. You see, because a very scary thing is happening. It's been happening in the Christian world for a very long time, but it's happening in the Adventist church. It's been happening for quite a while here too. There are new ideas coming up that not only don't have Bible studies to go along with them. I, I have no other way to describe what happens other than they have an anti-Bible study to go along with them. What I mean by that, is, let me show you this as an example. Almost 20 years ago now, my freshman year of college had ended. I chose to leave California for a fresh start. I went to Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska, where all of my other friends went to La Sierra in California. At the end of my freshman year, we all got together and we all got to talking and comparing notes as to what we learned our freshman year in college. 
And all of my friends started telling me that they learned that the book of Genesis was not literal history. It wasn't literal history. It was just a series of allegories and uh, parables used to prove a point. But it wasn't literal history. Therefore, it can't be used for doctrine. They said the same thing about the book of Job, by the way. Even 20 years ago in our own colleges, the faith in Scripture is being chipped away by some. Now let me ask you this. After everything we just went through, what does removing the book of Genesis do to every single one of our beliefs? When Christ... Go through some time and see how many times Christ referred to the people or the events of Genesis. Every single time. He refers to them as real people, as real events. If we suddenly say now that the book of Genesis is not real people and not real events, what does that do to the teachings of Christ? Well, see, but... See, but that's okay. Because... One of the other things that's being taught is that some of what Christ did and said, well, see, he was culturally biased. And so we can now pick and choose from what he said and what he did and remove some of those things. And some of those things now, we don't have to use those as doctrine. And it continues on. The writings of Paul... Boy, that guy was apparently really culturally biased. See, and and so what happens is we lose Genesis, we lose Job. There's questions put on the teachings of Christ. Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. And so suddenly now there's this huge section of Scripture that our own people have lost faith in. They have been given these anti-Bible studies in which their faith in Scripture is chipped away at. But see, now that people have lost their faith in Scripture, see, now I've got great new ideas for you that you wouldn't have accepted before, but now you will. Because I can quote a few texts here and there out of context, because context is now up to whoever, And you'll go along with these new ideas because of the anti-Bible study that I gave you first. And there are so many things coming into the church now that fit within the context that I just described. When... That city in Colombia was destroyed. People ignored the evidence because of what the experts, because of what the leaders told them. Well, now in the Christian world, we're being told to ignore the evidence by experts, by some of the leaders. Those in Colombia just lost their lives. They just lost their earthly lives. But for us, something far greater is at stake. Our eternal life, our salvation is at stake. And not just ours, but our family, our friends, our neighbors. We are to be witnesses to people. Our goal is not only to get to heaven to be with Christ, but to bring as many people with us as possible. The Bible details what is going to happen and what we need to do in order to 
save our lives, our eternal lives, and the lives of those around us. Because there is an end coming. Just like with those people. There is, in, in Colombia, there is an end coming. And we have all of the evidence that tells us exactly what to do. But yet we have people telling us to ignore it. As we examine these things, as we examine things that we're presented with, with new ideas, new teachings, we need to look at each one real carefully. But if it doesn't go along with Scripture, with the evidence, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how fair or kind or politically correct it sounds, if it doesn't go along with the Bible, with the evidence that we have, we need to put it aside. Because it is our very lives, our eternal lives at stake. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with your church locally, worldwide, all Christians, all your people from all denominations, all of your people all over the world. Please call them out of these false systems Please bring them to you. Please help guard each one of us, your own people. Help us to know truth from false. And please help us to join together one day in heaven. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.